Taylor Hill, welcome to Pretty Smart. Thanks for having me. I'm really happy to have you here. It's yeah. been a long time coming. So you grew up riding horses, biking, outdoors. Mm -hmm. I think that like learning about you, I would have never thought that Taylor would have ended up in fashion. <laughs> What would 14-year-old Taylor be most surprised about your life today? I mean, probably every single aspect of it. I knew, obviously, what fashion was and models. And, you know, I'm from Colorado, so Ralph Lauren was a really big deal, a huge designer that everybody in Colorado knew who that yeah. was. But I didn't really understand as a whole the concept of fashion. I didn't know that that was something that I would ever do, that it was something that was possible for me to do. I didn't even know how to access the fashion industry. So when I was scouted and kind of thrown into it all, I kind of look back on who I was when I was 14 and think, how did I get here? So yeah, I just, I feel like 14 year old Taylor is just constantly in awe of my life and can't even believe it. Cause every day I wake up, I'm, I have no idea how I got here. <laughs> so you mentioned being scouted at 14. From what it sounds like your life changed so quickly. Yeah. What it, happened? It did, but it didn't. It's kind of interesting because everything takes time. So sometimes it feels when I'm telling the story of my career that it happened overnight and I went from middle of nowhere, Colorado to fashion shows in New York the next day, but it wasn't really like that at all. It took years. I, I was I was definitely scouted and things started moving and changing quickly, but I moved to New York when I was 17. And before that, I was just kind of booking direct jobs from my town in Colorado and going to school and flying to LA, New York, Paris, which is like crazy. But it was definitely a, a time of building and getting yeah. images for my book and gaining experience and going on castings and meeting photographers and stylists and editors of magazines and casting directors for big projects. So it really took time. So it really felt like my career started blossoming and blooming by the time I turned 18. So it was four years of hard work, dedication, traveling, and, you know, booking one thing after the other for yeah. my life to feel like, oh my God, it's so different now. When I talk to people that have careers in high school, it's 50-50. Some people are like, everyone was really supportive and nice. And some people say it was brutal and people, like other kids are so mean. What was it like for you? <laughs> for me, because I'm from the middle of nowhere, I feel like people didn't understand what I was doing. It's not like I was an actor on a TV show that they watched every day. Right. I was a model in fashion campaigns that they didn't understand or they had never seen or heard of that brand before. So I feel like what I was doing was very niche and kind of easy to hide where people didn't really know. They just thought Taylor misses a lot of school. She's like a model, whatever that means. We never see any of her work. So <laughs> it, I don't know. I just also I was very I feel like I always tr tried to be low key because I did not like attention. I was very shy. I had, you know, my four or five friends and I really loved them and they were great. And, you know, my friends in school were awesome, but I didn't have a lot of them. And I was, yeah. I liked that. I prefer it that way. I'm Are not, you still like that? Yeah, I'm still like that. I don't, I don't have like a huge friend group. I have amazing friends that I love and I feel like I have quite a few, like, I do feel like I personally have a, a lot of friends, but maybe yeah. it's not, it's not like 20, 30 people. And, yeah. you know, so um, for me, I felt still pretty normal when I was in school because yeah. I think my my job, it was kind of not something that was sort of in your face where everything changes and the next thing you know, you're famous and you're on a TV show and the kids in your school are watching you on the TV show. Like that didn't really happen to me. So I feel like I kind of kept a really good mix and a really good balance of both. Yeah. I read, or actually I saw in another interview that you did that you felt ugly as a kid. Yeah. No one can believe you felt ugly. What what was that? <laughs> I don't know. I do. I felt, I feel like a lot of teenagers maybe go through this phase yeah. where they just feel awkward in their body and just uncomfortable in who they are. And I definitely felt different. I was really tall. I was yeah. really thin. I didn't have like a typical high school boys ideal 
like pretty girl aesthetic. I don't know what the word is, but I, I was like gangly and, you know, taller than all the boys. So I didn't, I didn't feel beautiful. Not because boys made me feel bad. They just didn't even know I existed. You know what I mean? It was, that's just the way it was. I, no one was mean to me. Like no one was, it wasn't like that. It was just because I felt uncomfortable because I was like, I don't, I'm too tall. I'm taller than all of them. There's no way they're going to like me. So I didn't put myself out there and I didn't get like actual confirmation if that was true or not. It was just something that I started believing in my head because I felt uncomfortable. (laughs) So do you remember when you started feeling not ugly? When I started modeling, it really helped me with my self-confidence. I feel like some people tell a different story of the modeling industry, but I think for me, my personal experience was yeah. that it was really helpful and being on sets with adults and hair and makeup people and stylists and photographers saying, you're so beautiful, changed the way I thought about myself. At first, I didn't believe it. I was like, there's no way they think I'm actually beautiful. Like, that's crazy. I've never had attention before. I didn't really want it. I didn't know how to like do anything or act to receive it. So when they started telling me you're really beautiful or this image is so beautiful, I was like, really? (laughs) Who, me? So for me at 14, having to start, you know, doing all of these different, being in all these different scenarios and being around adults and being on a set, you have to sort of fake it till you make it as in the sense of um, confidence. So yeah. I started pretending like I was confident and then it slowly started becoming true because that's cool. I got positive reinforcement from people around me and people supporting me on sets. And I think they understood that I was really young and, and there was a lot of maybe over encouragement that I got that if I was older, I maybe wouldn't have received because they're like, oh my God, she's so cute. She's like 15. Right. So we have to make her feel excited and they would play like you know Selena Gomez and like teen pop music for me on set and like make me feel a part of it I guess so for me it it helped me feel start feeling okay like maybe I am beautiful. Did you ever feel um like commodified in any way? I no, because maybe I was just really young and I didn't really understand that or know what that looks like or meant but I also feel like I was pretty protected because my mom came with me everywhere so I think that she set a really good boundary with people around me and was always on set always watching always making sure I felt comfortable and like I was okay so for me I didn't ever really feel like that part of me feels like it's because you were on your soul path too yeah you know like it's not for everybody even Mm -hmm. though some people do it it's true it was for you I loved it I felt comfortable as soon as I started doing it and you know people have asked me you know it makes no sense it's not adding up you say you're really shy and then who you are being a model like how is that possible I honestly have no idea because for me I felt like one side of me would turn off and another side would just light up when I was on a set I felt like this is where I'm supposed to be this is where I belong this is what I meant to do and I never had a feeling of why am I here? Why am I doing this? Maybe as I got older and I've been working really hard and you always wonder, am I doing the right thing or am I going to make it? When am I going to have my, you know, big chance or when is it, when am I going to get past this stage and go to the next stage? And there's definitely a lot of that because in modeling, it's, it's still a creative field. So I feel like there's a lot of luck involved in a lot of it and timing is everything, but I definitely had determination and I really wanted to, to to do it and I was happy to be there so kind of goes hand in hand <laughs> I, I really like hearing that and I'm not just saying that to be corny I haven't heard that story very much and I think that's really cool yeah so what's interesting to me is that modeling was not a dream of yours but here it is it became your reality yeah and now you're in this very rare and exclusive club of people that are called supermodels. Oh, I and love that, you are. And I, there's less than a hundred in the world, I would say. How do you feel when I say that? I don't really know if I believe it yet because I think I'm 
personally, I still feel like I'm really young and like too, maybe even like too young in my career, even though I've been doing this for 14 years, there's still a part yeah. of me that's like, supermodels are Christy Turlington, Cindy Crawford, um, Naomi Campbell, Kate Moss. Like I think of those women as Giselle Bundchen, Adriana Lima. Like they've had 25 year plus careers, like worked with all the greats, done anything and everything you could possibly dream of in fashion and done it multiple times over. So right. sometimes I feel, well, I don't know if I'm there yet. And I don't know, people say that to me and I feel, feel like weird bashful. about it. I'm like, ah, oh, I, don't, I don't know. Like, I, it's like, oh, maybe not yet. We'll see. Does it feel <laughs> right? Like you could step into that title? Maybe one day, maybe I'll be more, um, accepting or like comfortable with, with the term but yeah I yeah. think one one day I like the idea of it I don't know I work really hard I don't ever want to like diminish my work ethic or my career or what I've managed to accomplish at my age but yeah for me I hear supermodel and I think of supermodels you know like those amazing models as women who have had such long careers and worked so hard for so long I'm like that's a supermodel <laughs> I I think you are. I also think you're in the next generation of those names. You know what yeah. I mean? Like it just takes time. We'll see, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think the difference is between a good model and a great model? Oh, I've had to think about that. No one's ever asked me that before. Ooh, good. I think a, a good model is you're there, you're doing your job, you're showing up on time, you're getting the shots and you're doing what's required of you to be a model, but I think a great model is putting in effort and, you know, collaborating, making things better or trying their hardest to make the day feel fun and, um, yeah, creative and seamless. You mm -hmm. know, I think what makes the greats, the supermodels that I just spoke of what I think makes them so incredible and so amazing and why they're supermodels is because I've been in the industry for, you know, 14 years and I've heard about all of them and I know people who've worked with them for a really long time. And while I don't know them personally, I can say that people who do have personal accounts with them have nothing but positive things to say mm. that they show up on time. They're there to do their job. They thank everyone when they leave, if they have an opinion about something or they're not comfortable with something, they say it, but they do it in a way that's respectful. They are really fun to be around. They love working with them on set. They love that they have all this energy and they're great models because yeah. they get in front of the camera and they know how to do their job. They, like they take know direction. the lighting. They know yeah. like how to make their body look fluid. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So the, I think that's what makes them so like amazing and great. One of the things that I think about with modeling is like you are the nexus of energy on set. So if you come in and you're like a little sleepy that day, the photographer is not as inspired. The yeah. PAs aren't as inspired. Like you have to show up and always be inspired. Always and be on and be, you know, excited to be there and, you know, make the day feel bright because like what happens when you're going through a breakup? It's not happening. <laughs> <laughs> turn it off not happening put it away and you're you know? able to do that yeah yeah <laughs> damn maybe I'm like I don't know a little uh what's the word you can compartmentalize compartmentalize things. yeah I, I just also I just feel like I don't know any better you know when you've been doing yeah. it for so long and that's all you know and that's all you know how to do then that's just kind of what you have to do what happens if physically you don't feel good one day? Like, what oh, if you're there. like, I'm bloated or I ate too much for dinner? Not too bad. <laughs> you just figure it out. Yeah. I mean, I've the craziest story and why I love my mom so much <laughs> is because when I was like 16 years old, I flew to Stockholm and was shooting for H&M, mm. who was an amazing client when I was younger, a teenager. They they book you for three days out of the week. You fly there. You stay there for, for three, four days. You go every day at the same time. It's just kind of, it's a really nice break to the demand, the go, go, go of fashion. And they have, it was really beautiful and you have lunch and it's just 
It's a really great day and I have such fond memories of working with them. But one time when I was 16, we flew to Stockholm, my mom and I, and we were in the back of the bus and they were not serving water. It was like a, this big of a cup when they came around once and then we fell asleep and we didn't drink enough water. And I think when we landed and we got there, we got some sort of like dehydration or some sort of stomach bug or sickness from maybe not drinking enough water, being really dehydrated, being at 30,000 feet for so long. Yeah. And we land in Stockholm and that night, both of us wake up at four o'clock in the morning, sick to our stomachs. I can't keep water down. I'm like throwing up. I don't know if that's like yeah, gross no, to say. No, well, no. And okay. I... I'm like so sick, like shaking, sweating. And so is my mom. And we have to be up at eight o'clock in the morning and go to set and work. I have to work all the next day. And I've, they've flown me there from Colorado. They paid for me to be there. They flew me there. They're paying for my hotel. I'm their model for the week. Mm -hmm. So they're depending on me and I, I have to go. I mean, yeah, that's my job. So I show up at eight o'clock in the morning. My mom's got like a trash can from the hotel with with us because like every 30 minutes I I'm trying to drink water and eat a cracker and I can't keep it down and she's in the same state that I'm in and we get to set and there and she's like she's really sick shaking sweating like she can't really stand for a very long time she's like but well we're here and they were like are you sure are you okay and I did the full day. They let me go an hour early and then they booked a local model that was like in Stockholm already. And they, they were like, you're too sick. You have to, you, you can't stay the rest of the week. So, um, but I was prepared to show up and like do the whole job because that's what they paid me to do. So for me, it just physically, physically, whatever's happening, emotionally, mentally, whatever's happening, I don't, it doesn't affect me. I feel like I have to at least try to show up if they've asked me to be there. Is there something that you think of that you pull strength from in those moments? I'm asking because I had a moment like this. I had like, I always wanted to work for E. I finally got my shot. They booked me on like an audition for three days. It was like to be a part of the show for three days. Yeah. And I don't know why, but I got a flu shot. So dumb. And I've never been so sick in my life. Yeah. like 104 fever shaking. And I was like, I'm not messing this up. And I am from Chicago. So I turned on this YouTube video of Michael Jordan. And it's like this famous basketball game where he had wow. a, like 101 fever. Mm-hmm. And he's sweat. You can tell he's so sick. And in the fourth quarter, he's like, put me in. And then he like, he passed out after. Yeah. And I was like, I got to summon that energy. Like, yeah. what do you think about in those moments? I think... If I don't do it, someone else will. Will I lose this opportunity? Will they think that I'm unprofessional? I don't know. Maybe it's like a a fear of losing everything I'm working for. So I just kind of, I have to do it. I just show up and I do it. What are you working for? I don't know. Just to have fun. I don't know. You know. Because I love it. I just, I like my job. I'm... I can't believe I get to do it and I am yeah. I'm grateful every day. So if I do something to jeopardize that and my career and my path and what I want to do then yeah I've let myself down, not anyone else, just myself. Yeah. As somebody who didn't feel beautiful and then came into the modeling <laughs> world and started feeling beautiful How do you think about it now? How do you think about beauty now? Because um, from the outside, it seems like a lot of pressure because like the average woman walks around and feels like their beauty is part of their value. But in modeling, it really is. Yes. It's literally the currency of my job is how you look. Yeah. I think it's another compartmentalizing thing. We just kind of have to put it to the side and say, it's not about me it's not about it's sure it's sometimes about how I look for sure but it's not about like how I look you know what I mean Mm -hmm. it's about what they want me to look like can I do that for them am I able to transform in their eyes into 
some sort of vision in their head, which for sure is about how you look, but it's not about, it's not because I'm, oh, I'm not this, I'm too that, or, you know, I'm not good enough, or it's, I don't think it has anything to do with a, a negative attributes to how you are perceived. I think it's just, it's literally, it could literally just be, she's not blonde. Yeah. It could literally just be, you know, she's too tall. It's just like something simple like that. And that's why. Right. So you have to sort of separate your physical self and in your modeling career from your physical self in your everyday life, because they're not looking at you the way you think they are. I mm-hmm. think it's very much di- like very separate. And it also has nothing to do with who you are, you know, because I know that obviously the o- I've gotten this opportunity and I get to walk in those doors because people like the way that I look. Yeah. But I think that I'm still here and I get to continue to do what I do as my job because people like who I am. And I, I've i made great friendships. I have amazing relationships. And it's sort of just like doing any other job where you create connections and build a network. And if you leave one opportunity and you know that your old boss is here, you might be in more of a position to get that job because right. they worked with you at your last job. So I kind of feel like modeling in a sense has a lot of similar attributes to that in terms of a regular job but in the beginning instead of it being about your resume for sure it's about how you look yeah my physical self is my hi here I am here's my resume and then I can continue to keep booking because I kind of get to grow and expand off of that so you turn 18 and you book the Victoria's Secret angel job. Yeah. And at that time, that was the job. Oh, yeah. yeah. There was no other job. That was it. <laughs> I was so excited to hear that in your audition, it was your authenticity yeah. that won them over. Can you tell that story? Well, I just kind of... So I went in really early. They have three days of castings. And I was there on the first day and I had to go... In at 10 a.m., which was when it started, and I had to leave two hours later for L- to go here to LAX for a shoot in California, and that was my only slot to like do the casting. So I I was the first one there on the first day. It was literally me. I walked in and I, there was no one else there. You don't ever want to be the first one because you no. feel like they forget about they you. They forget about you. Yeah, and here I was being like, well. Oh. Um, the first one, they're never going to remember me. And I just kind of went in there and I was really nervous, but I, I had to go, you know, I had places to be. I had to go to the airport. I'm thinking about the next thing. And I think because maybe my head was in the place of, I'm not going to think too much about this because I'm stressed about getting there. Yeah, I kind of feel like I was really present and kind of dropped a lot of the anticipation like am I going to be good enough and also I had been casting for runway shows for four years before I did the Victoria's Secret fashion show so even though it's a little bit of a different casting process I was used to a version of that process you walk in there and sure it's really intimidating there's four people at a table lined up in front of you and then another four to six people behind them there Mm -hmm. and they're all watching you and there's a big camera filming you and you're just like oh gosh But I just kind of went in and did my thing. And, you know, the advice I got from agents and other friends and people who have done the casting before is that they're looking for your personality. This is the only situation in modeling, if you've been in fashion, where they don't really, they're not here for the blue steel catwalk. They don't care about how fast you walk, how edgy you look. It's not about that for them. It's about they want to feel like they know you. Wow. And I walked in and I was obviously really nervous, but I was kind of in this place of like, I got to go. And they were asking me some questions like, where are you from? And I was just laughing. And then I think I said the F word at one point. And then I was like, oh no, I, th- I just said the F word. And I like, <laughs> said that out loud. And I just feel like because I was myself in that moment, which was an accident, <laughs> it, it was what made them maybe remember me and stick out in their mind. So yeah. I booked it on my first try probably because I was at, like a, a, just acting like a complete idiot. <laughs> so I've heard you say that you kind of call this like your naivete. 
that you yeah. feel like you went in and because of that, yeah. you booked this job. I'm wondering if now that you're more seasoned, you can still summon that or do you feel like you walk in differently now? I definitely s still have that. <laughs> I think that's just a, maybe a part of who I am where I just feel like, oh, hello, like here I am. Uh, <laughs> Happy to be here. I know, I'm just here. Like, I don't know how I got here. I just, I don't know. I just feel like I... I still haven't lost that. And I, it's beautiful. If I was going to go in for Victoria's Secret casting now, I feel like I would bring the same energy and the same, uh, just kind of like, oh, I really yeah. don't know. I'm just winging it. Because <laughs> that's the thing is with modeling, as I said before, it's so much about luck and timing. So you can't be in control. It's so out of my control. It's crazy. So what else can you do except for just be like, so cool. I'm in the room. I made it this far. And then everything after that is like, well, whatever. <laughs> How much Delulu is involved? hundred the most of it's delusion. All of, I mean, I am delusional. I think I'm I think delusional. I, I, I just like, really? I mean, I'm I, I, in my, in terms of my career, not in everything I do, I'm obviously I like having a plan and I think about things. I'm, I know I'm a smart person, but I just like, sometimes you just have to like throw it all out the window and let it go and just be delusional for the day. I think you have to. Every to achieve time. anything great, you have to believe you can. It's yeah. part of it. Yep. Okay. <laughs> this is not on my cards, but I am very curious. <laughs> you're, a Vic uh, you're a Victoria's Secret fashion model. What's dating like? Like every man wants to date a Victoria's Secret fashion model. Well, I don't know. I never really dated. <laughs> I had one boyfriend from 18 to 23. Oh, wow. And then I met my husband not shortly after. I think I'm a, what's the word? A, I guess, mysterial monogamist. Is that like a thing? I, yeah. Is that what I'm trying to say? So I just kind of feel uncomfortable with people that I don't know very well. And I feel like I've always been like that. Like I don't have that many friends. I loved my four, five friends in school. They're amazing and they were my friends. And I was like, I like you, so I'll talk to you. <laughs> and I just feel like, you know, again, I maybe I was just kind of naive and like delusional and I didn't really pay attention to that because I had a boyfriend. So I was like, well, I'm with this person. So I'm just going to, I'm wow. with you. So like nothing ever felt tempting to you. Like it was never like, cause I'm sure not to be weird, but I feel like there were like probably famous people in your DMs. Like, yeah. you know, like it never felt tempting. No, because I'm like, it's still a stranger, <laughs> like stranger danger. I always get nervous meeting new people for the first time. And, you know, especially men, because I feel like I never really had a lot of interaction or experience in school. And I always felt a little shy or closed off or, you know, if I fell in love with someone, then that just became my whole world and my yeah. person. You know, I had a boyfriend in high school, uh, a boyfriend when I was, you know, a little in my younger 20s and here I am married. So I, I don't know. I always just feel like maybe it's, there's probably a lot of pros to it and maybe a lot of cons to it, but I worked. I'm fine. I like where I'm at, I guess. <laughs> I like that you were always true to yourself. Yeah. Was it hard to deal with the male attention from that time? I mean, sometimes, but I didn't really feel it that much because I think a lot of, surprisingly, a lot of my following and, you know, people like fan base, I guess, were young girls and young women that's cool and uh that was really cool and that felt really good that um they liked me and yeah. wanted to watch me and follow me and that felt really exciting to me because I love women I'm from a family of mostly women I have two sisters and my mom obviously came with me everywhere I went so I was raised around a lot of women and I think to me I love um feminine companionship. I think it's the most beautiful bond that you could possibly have is female yeah. friendships. And connecting to millions of young women was really exciting for me at the time. So when there was like an odd, oddball, you know, male kind of gaze, I would just kind of like, Oop, dodge hard left. I was like, Oop, okay, <laughs> no thanks. And you knew Thank how you. to dodge it. 
yeah, maybe not really to the best of my ability, but I was kind of like, okay, okay, bye. <laughs> I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I interviewed a Victoria's Secret model a few years ago. And she said to me that she thought that when she got cast for the VS fashion show, that she would never feel ugly again in her life. <laughs> and she said from that day forward, she never felt more insecure. Oh, wow. I know that was not your experience. Yeah. I'm curious what it was like being in that group of women. I'm sure there is a lot of insecurity. Um, yeah. There are, there is. I mean, for me, I, I loved it. Um, my, some of my closest friends still to this day are the women that I worked with in Victoria's Secret. Yeah. And I feel like my experience was completely different. I think maybe a lot of it had to do with the timing of how old I was and the timing in, in which I was stepping into Victoria's Secret because I came in 2014 and I was 18. And a lot of the women who were there were either in their late 20s and early 30s or mm -hmm. um, mid 20s. So I was definitely the youngest one there. And I think I was probably the most annoying one there <laughs> because I was so excited that I was there. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, it's you, it's you, it's you. Oh, I love all of you. And I think because I kind of came in with this energy of just like this little kid, I felt like I was everybody's little sister mm -hmm. and they made me feel like that. Oh, they cool. made me feel like they would watch out for me, take care of me, make sure I was okay and check in and be like, you're good over there. And I'd be like, oh, I'm doing great. So I feel like everybody's experience is different and completely valid, but that was my personal That's experience amazing. and how I went into it. I felt like these aren't, amazing women. I was just in awe of them every single day and on every single set instead of maybe if I had gone in and felt like I was being compared to them or comparing myself, things would have taken a much different road. Yeah. But I think because I was genuinely so in awe with them, I, I felt motivated by them, inspired by them. And they were, I felt like they were teaching me a lot of things and showing me kind of the ropes and being like my big sister is kind of in a way. Well, I know you always look to, to Giselle and you joined your agency IMG because of her, yes, right? Because of her. Yeah. yeah. Did you get to meet her during the VS? Days? She was out of the, she was already up, moved on and upwards after, as, by the time I came in there. So she wasn't a part of Victoria's Secret anymore, but I did meet her once at a party and she was really nice. And I was like, oh, I read your book. <laughs> Why do you love her? Like out of all the models, what was it about her? I just think because she has something about her. She has this drive. I read her book. I've, you know, I know her story. I, I think that she's incredible. She works so hard and she came from nowhere and a small town and worked her way up was walking a hundred shows a season and she was just it's incredible to see her her career trajectory where she how, how where she went and where she is now and she still has so much more to do and so much more career ahead of her I think I really respect her especially as a businesswoman as a person you never hear anything bad about her. She's fun to work with. She apparently loves dancing. I'm, I sound like a crazy person. Like, no. Like she's going to be like, this girl knows way too much about me. <laughs> like, I think it means you're a student. I just love like, I love that about her. I love hearing that she's, she's a pleasure on set to work with. She's fun. She dances and she's just having the best time. I think that's such an incredible reputation to have. And yeah. I aspire to hopefully someday collect a similar one. So the Jay Shetty interview that you did, yeah. you said um, the grass is always greener. The tall, thin girls strive to be something else and vice versa. What did VS teach you about self-image? It's a loaded question. I think it did teach me a lot, but I think I also learned a lot on my own, I, just sort of outside of that. I think for me, I loved 
doing Victoria's Secret. I loved being a part of it. I had a really great time. And for me, it was a really positive experience. And I think it taught me a lot about confidence and feeling beautiful. And I loved my picture being taken like that. I loved feeling like that, the hair blowing, the beautiful hair and makeup. It was my best of friends, like doing my hair and makeup on those days. So you felt, or I felt like the best possible version of myself. And I, I loved it. I, I loved the glamour. I loved the, I just, it, it was such a, it was just like a, maybe I'm, I have rose colored glasses, but to me, it was no. really just so sparkly, this memory I have. And I have, uh, I look back on those times with a lot of joy, but I also think that for me, because I grew up in the industry and I grew up in fashion, my self image and self worth was something that I, I taught myself and practiced with myself because I don't think you should let your job or what you do for a living teach that to you. I think you should always keep that outside of what you're doing. And I always love keeping those two things separate. Mm -hmm. This is my personal self. This is who I am. These are my boundaries. This is how I think about myself and the respect I want to have for me, other people to have for me in my personal life and in my career. But I would never let my business or my job teach me those things. Mm, That's so well said. Thank you. That's the first time I've ever said that out loud. So I just came to that conclusion right now. (laughs) It was really beautiful. Because I think particularly as women, we get so many messages that we let other people tell us who we are a lot. I think I also have a lot of, um, lot. I have to thank my parents a lot for that mentality because they did raise me to, to, always, you know, stand up for yourself, know you who you are, always be yourself. Yeah. You know, they kept me grounded. They kept me true to who I am and seeing that it doesn't matter what people say about you. And, you know, I, there was definitely days where I really wanted to book a job and I didn't, and I would just cry and cry and cry to my mom. And she would be like, it wasn't meant to be. There's a reason you didn't book those things. You have to believe that if this is what you want to do, and you want to pursue this, and this is going to be your career, and you love what you're doing, that everything will come. So you didn't book that because who knows why? Maybe it's because you have brown hair. Maybe it's because you are too tall. You're, maybe you're not tall enough. You can't change those things. There's, She's like, maybe you could dye your hair for sure, but like, do you really want to do that? Like, to, to do that thing, you want to be booked for who you are. So be yourself and they'll book you. So like, I feel like I was really, this mentality was really instilled in me that I define who I am. I say what I, how I look at myself, how I feel about myself, not them, not that, not my job, not a man, myself. So. (laughs) I think a lot of people say like beauty is power. Um, Where does your power come from? I think hopefully my heart, (laughs) I think I'm like a very uh, emotional person and I can, what's the word? Is it empath? Is that what people are? Yeah. Like I feel other people's emotions too. Yeah. And I think that's a powerful thing. So I never really excelled in school or Mm -hmm. traditional education, but I feel like I really excel in sort of understanding people or feeling other people's emotions and sort of being able to not like change myself, but like adjust the way things go based off of what the, the vibe I'm getting to say. It's true. (laughs) Like I I actually think it's like emotional intelligence. (laughs) Yeah. Like read the room. So I feel like for me, that's what I love to lean on is just I think emotion is a really powerful thing. And obviously it can, being overly emotional or being emotional in a negative way can take you down a whole other road. But I think being in tune with your emotions and being able to read other people's emotions can be super powerful. Okay, you chopped your hair into a pixie cut almost a year ago, Mm -hmm. September. Yep. Tell me how this happened. Because as a model, that's a really big decision. Yeah, definitely. But I also feel like it was a, um, it was the right time because 
I had had the same haircut for forever, my whole career. And you weren't going through anything? <laughs> no, no. I well, only maybe. chopped my hair when I was going through something. Maybe I was going through some. I mean... Yes and no. I was really, I re always really wanted to do it, like always. And I knew one day I would. And I think the timing of it just so happened, like it was after I, you know, lost my dog Tate and I had just gotten married. And I think it was just a lot of things lining up for me in the universe where I was like, this is something that I've always really wanted to do. I'm ready for a fresh start. I'm ready for yeah. something to visually define another chapter of my life. So snip, snip. So I love that you mentioned Tate because your company now is Tate and Taylor. I know you're so cute. I'm putting it there for me. Like, I love it. It's such a happy bag <laughs> with the dog. Oh, this happy. I, that's him. That's Tate. Yeah. So I actually really love your tagline that it's for your for people and pets. Yeah. What does that mean? I think for me it means because they give so much to you that when you're taking care of them, it's really it's a it's a relationship. It's for the two of you and. Being able to help people help their pets is something that I think as a company we really strive to do. And yeah. being there and support for people who have pets is, I think, something that I personally felt was lacking in the in the pet space and in the in industry. There's not a lot of clarification on why are you buying these things? What makes these products good? Why is this better for your for your dog than this thing? Or, you know, I just I had to do a lot of that research on my own when I had Tate and we, especially when we were going through, um, his, his battle with cancer, it was a lot of just, oh my God, I'm overwhelmed and not really knowing what to do and having to figure it out for ourselves. So I think, mm -hmm. you know, my mission and drive is to just make it really comprehensive for people because, you know, you're the one doing the research and taking care of them. So make stuff that's, under, like that people can understand so that they know why they're taking care of their pets better. So I've never had a pet. Oh no. In my whole life, in 33 years, I've never had a pet. So I've, I've never asked somebody this. I'm curious, what did that relationship give you? Like, why do people love their pets so much? What was it? It's something that I feel like is really difficult to articulate, but I always try my best. I think for me, the relationship and love that you get from a pet, no matter what it is, if it's a, a cat, a turtle, a dog, a chicken, a snake, I don't, it doesn't matter. I think that animals have such a pure love. They have such an amazing consciousness that feels almost innocent or childlike before the world gets involved, before society gets involved, before expectation gets involved, like what we deal with as human beings. I don't think that animals have that. They don't think about what am I going to get from this or what's this relationship mean for me? I think that human nature is a little bit to be self-centered or selfish or introspective instead of thinking of others. I think that's something that we have to strive to do every day is to think outside of ourselves and think about others. But having a pet or me having Tate, I felt like every single day I was thinking about someone other than myself. How's Tate doing today? What does he need? I have to wake up in the morning and make his food, take him for a walk, make sure he has enough water. I'm doing tasks every right. single day to take care of something where they're only goal or only thing that matters to them in their life is me mm. and his love for me. And it's such a, it really taught me unconditional love because no matter how, what I did, how bad of a day I had, you know, if I was in a bad mood, if I was in a great mood, if I was what I felt like the worst mom in the world, he loved me no matter what. He looked at me the same way every single day. Oh my gosh, I love you. Oh, I'm so excited you're home. And he portrayed that love to me in his own special little way. And I feel like we really did have a very special secret language that 
nobody else understood. Like I could look at him and say things and move a certain way. He knew exactly what I needed and what that meant. And I've never had that, not with another person, not with another animal. I feel like he was in a really weird way, sort of a soulmate and some, someone that I feel like I must have known in a past life that came back to me in this current form. And I was just so connected to him. Wow. And I I don't know how to explain it any other way than that. <laughs> I can't even imagine, like, because I know this company was born out of the grief of, of Tate passing yeah. too. And now that you're explaining it to me, it like hurts. It hurts me. I can't imagine what it was like when he passed. It was very difficult. Um, but, you know, it's also something that you understand because when you have a pet, you know that they're not going to be with you forever. Yeah. They're with you for a certain amount of time in life. And I do think that they're there for a reason and they're there when you need them the most for yeah. the things that you need them the most for. And he was there for me in times when I would be probably a completely different person and my life could have gone a very different direction if it wasn't for him. So I think that even though him passing and it felt yeah. really sudden, I think that he was, his timing was perfect. He was with me. I wish he was with me for longer, but he was with me for when I needed him the most. And I think that's also something that's so magical about animals is they know. They just, they're yeah. so soulful. I think they're really connected to something divine and spiritual that we don't even understand. And I just, I think they're amazing creatures. I froze my eggs uh, in January and I stayed with a girlfriend and she had a dog. Yeah. And I've never been a dog person really. And her dog, while I was freezing my eggs, kept laying on my stomach. Yeah. And as soon as I was done, he was done with me. Yeah. He could feel it. He could feel it. They know. They they can sense things like it was unbelievable. Because maybe it was an emotional moment for you, or you were scared, or you were holding tension, especially here. And yeah. like they go and gravitate to where you hold tension and emotion. How, good, bad, you know sad, mad. Yeah. They know where, where it is. They can, they can sense it. My dog now, Salem, no, he can smell where I'm in pain. It's the craziest thing. Like he, he like can sniff like my head and he like sniffs it and it, it, I have a migraine. I'm like, how do you know? Wow. Like he always like sniffs this like spot on my, like, he'll, like come up to me in the morning and like sniff and he'll like hover and like kind of like lick this shoulder. spot in my shoulder. I'm like, this is weird. <laughs> like, Wow. It's really, it's really interesting. I have a question you don't have to answer if, if you don't want to. Um, when you say he, you need, he, you needed Tate the most, what did you mean? Just, I think there was, I was going through a lot of things during this time in, in my life um, that I won't really like touch on, but I did have, I did go through a lot of stuff and then probably the biggest one that I, I have shared is that I had a miscarriage three years ago. And that was one of the hardest things that I ever went through, regardless of, you know, probably a lot of other things that were difficult. Tate was with me for nine years. And, um, throughout that time, it was, I was, go I was growing up, I was 18 to tw 20, when, 27, when, when I lost him. So he was with me for formative years when I was going through probably the most that you go through as a young woman. So he saw all that change and all that growth and he was just a constant and a yeah. consistent um, person in my life that loved me no matter what I was going through, no matter who I was becoming or he just loved me so much. So I feel like I wanted to do my best for him. Um, and when I um, lost my pregnancy, it was a really crazy time because it was in 2021. So there was still a lot of COVID restrictions and my husband is English and he couldn't come to the U S without quarantining in a green zone for two oh, weeks. Whoa. So we were not seeing each other consistently. It was really every couple of months. So we would be apart for two months and then he would quarantine wow. and then we would be together and he would stay as long as he could, but he was on a tourist visa, which is 90 days. So he, didn't ever want to mess with the U.S. government and overstay or get too close to um, his time in the States. So 
we did spend a lot of time apart together and it was a really difficult time for us because my industry was just starting to pick back up again. So being able to take jobs when I got uh, when I could was really important to me. So it was a time when I was prioritizing that and it was very difficult for us to always find a way to get to each yeah. other and be together. And um, when I found out I was pregnant, I he had just left and he had already done close to his 90 days. And he had, he, he's like, I, I, I'm going to wait in another country for two weeks before I can get to you. It just try to come to me. So I was looking every possible way that I could to get to him. And it's very difficult. I didn't have any work there. So I was trying to get like a special visa and do all this stuff. And it was, mm. took some time. And um, I had to wait until I had a couple of doctor's appointments before I could even get to him because my doctor was in the U.S. So I, I had to, it was just, it you was just very complicated so time. Too. It was very difficult because we couldn't physically be together. And wow, I didn't know by that. the time I did manage to figure out how to get to where he was, I was at home alone. It was, you know, a couple of days before my flight to his home. And uh, I started bleeding and I ultimately, you know, miscarried that night at like three o'clock in the morning and I was alone, but the only one who was physically able to be there for me was Tate. Yeah. And it was just, he just, you know, they know. And the way he just kind of laid with me and like, I almost, even though I was holding him, I felt like he was holding me. Yeah, And it was just like that physical contact that I felt like I was lacking so much because it was heartbreaking for um, both my husband and I that we couldn't be together. I knew it was really hard on him that all he wanted to do was hold me when he knew that this was happening and he stayed up on the phone with me all night long. And I know that it was like probably one of the most difficult things he's ever faced in his life. So yeah. um, I know that he was always really grateful for Tate for at least being able to be there for me. So um, that's one instance in, you know, that I can think of that's like, I just feel like if he hadn't been there, if he wasn't with me then, I don't know what I would have done. I think my experience would have been very different. Thanks for sharing that. When you talk about that kind of unconditional support, all I can compare it to in my own life is this therapist that I had. And it was like those 20s mm -hmm. are just, they're really hard. Yeah. And it's so interesting to me that you could find that love and support through a pet. Yeah. It's so beautiful. I mean, I think because there's just something about them where they are there for you. And it's just, it's a, it's a love that I feel like is really inexplainable in a weird way. And you have a new dog named Salem, mm -hmm. right? Okay. I love that you got a German Shepherd. Yes. You got a smart dog. He's very smart. Why did you choose a German Shepherd? My story with Salem is really random. I was volunteering at um, a shelter with a rescue organization that I work with. And I w wasn't going to go because Tate had just passed. Yeah. And I was feeling all sorts of things about being around puppies and dogs. And I was like, maybe I'm too vulnerable. What if I make a bad decision <laughs> or something? I don't know. I was just like, ah, nervous. And I just ended up going anyway. And... Um, my dog Salem was there in the shelter. Yeah. And I don't know. I was very, very drawn to him. He was like six months old probably. And he was just gorgeous. He's all black. He has these huge ears and this like really long, perfect nose. And he has these really sweet eyes. It was probably, he has a really sweet, like kind of dorky face. Like he ha makes these little like. He does. I saw it in your photos. These eyes all the time. He's sweet, you know. And there was probably, you know, upwards of 250 dogs in this shelter when I was there. And, you know, I went around and I met every single one, but I kept going back and standing in front of Salem's little house. Mm -hmm. He had this little house with a green lawn and a plastic pool. And I was just like standing in front of his little house. And I was like staring at him always. I was like, I love him. I was there for like three days. And you know, doing some work and vol the volunteering is like mostly just cleaning up poo poos, <laughs> which <laughs> is fine. It's fun, but is it's it, a part of it. It's, <laughs> it's a part of it. You know what I mean? It's their dogs. It's worth it. It's, yeah. They're cute and they come from hard 
backgrounds and anything to make them feel happy and safe and clean. Yeah. So, or it's like giving puppies baths and like, it's really cute. So it was fun. And, um, I, by like the second day I was speaking with the director of the, the organization. And I'm like, I really love this dog. He's so cute. He's so sweet. And she was like, well, do you want to spend some alone time with him? And you know, my husband's like, don't do it. <laughs> Just spend alone time with him. I was like, you sure? I would love to spend alone time with him. So we, she takes him out of his little house and like puts us in another little house and we're just kind of in there and we get to be alone. And I'm telling you, as soon as I get in there with him, he just like sighs and leans on me and he just kind of like relaxes into me. And I just like, oh, I'm like hold, like holding him again. He's like this big, but yeah. still he's massive, but he just felt so small at that moment. And he just like leaned into me and I felt really comfortable and we, I felt immediately connected with him. That's amazing. And uh, I don't know. I just couldn't stop thinking about him. And I spoke with the adoption agency. So they go from Georgia and they get transferred up to um, New Jersey and kind of dispersed throughout the Northeast to different adoption agencies and organizations that take them from the shelter and make sure they get placed in, in good homes. And the one that Salem went to was in Pennsylvania. And I you know, call them and I'm like, how's he doing? Like, I just want to check in. I really loved him. They were like, he's doing really well. Do you, you could come say hi and come see him if you want. Um, so we drive to, um, Philly and we go see him. And, uh, yeah, I just, I, I was like, I feel like we're not, we're not done with each other yet. And I, why something, did you choose a shelter dog? I don't know. I wasn't planning on it. I just like loved him. I just like felt connected to him. And I just, I don't know. I just, I can't explain it. I was, I really wasn't thinking I would, I, I had no motive or like huh. reasoning behind it. I just kind of, I like, I love dogs. I love rescue. I love being able to support re like rescue. And I know that there's so many dogs that need homes and so many um, dogs in shelters that need homes. And they're amazing dogs. So I just like, I love doing it. I love volunteering and I love helping. I just like love being around animals. So I was doing, just doing this yeah. and was like, I love you. Okay. We haven't held up the bag yet. <laughs> you have to hold it up. <laughs> okay. So Kate and Taylor, you went from fashion to founder. How does it feel to be a founder? It feels really good because... I'm doing something that I really love yeah. and I have such a huge passion for, and I feel like it's something that I get to put a lot of energy into that I'm doing something and building something for myself and something that I really love to do and, uh, and support causes and, you know, businesses that I really believe in. Yeah. And I, it's really been the most fun ever because, you know, coming from modeling and fashion, which is such a fun and crazy different worlds going stepping into entrepreneurship and especially in the pet space a whole other industry and a whole other field from what I'm used to it's been really really exciting and I just I love being able to learn by doing I'm definitely a, a doer I have to see it I'm a visual learner I like seeing things and knowing where they go knowing how it's going to look and then kind of going and changing and building from there so being able to do Tate and Taylor the way that we've done it has been really exciting and just kind of a cool new way to express myself. Have you taken any of the skill sets you've learned as a founder into modeling? Definite. I think definitely. I mean, I have a huge appreciation for people. I mean, I always have felt that way. I think what it takes to build a collection, do the design, right. create the show, produce the show, hire the models and, you know, from start to finish sort of plan out these pictures or fashion shows that we see that maybe just seem like a, a little blip but it's a lot of time and a lot of energy and a lot of work goes into it yeah and um it's they plan it for a year if not more and all we see is just an image for you know six months to a year but it's something that they've poured their heart and soul into for a year yeah um so kind of seeing more of the nitty gritty background work of what all of that looks like behind even just, I used to be a fit model and they would make the clothes on me. So I did see that aspect of it, but that now helps. I'm, yeah, now I'm seeing like a whole other side that I'm just like, it's, it's amazing what people are capable of. Would you ever start your own 
fashion line? I don't know. Never say never. I yeah. mean, it would be fun for sure. I just, I love dogs so much. I think I'm going to kind of like stick to that for a little bit, but. <laughs> okay. So at the beginning of our conversation, we talked about how you were, you called it your naivete, but I'm going to say like unapologetically yourself. Yeah. How are you unapologetically yourself now? I think I kind of am a little bit better at, um, saying what I want, what I like, what I don't like. Uh, but I always try to be respectful with all of that. But I definitely think that when you're younger, you're a little bit more nervous to say, you know, oh, I don't like this or, you know, maybe we should do it this way or, yeah. you know, correcting people if they're wrong. I always kind of got nervous to do that. Confrontation, never really liked that. Now I feel like I'm a little bit better at being able to confront a problem or if I have an issue with something, maybe. Yeah try and say how I feel, you know, I'm not taking any shit from people. I'm like, I don't like it. Good for you. <laughs> but I don't say it in a mean way, but I do say, no, thank you. Yeah. No, thank you. <laughs> okay. Some rapid fire. Ready? Best makeup tip you picked up in your years in front of the camera. Oh my God. That's I'm personally so curious about this. Best makeup tip. Cause your makeup today is so There's beautiful. There's so many, but, um, you're good. I would say the most interesting one I learned was um, heating a curling a eyelash curler with a hair dryer and then curling your eyelashes with that because it makes it really go up and Ooh. stay longer, especially if you're doing fake eyelashes and curling the fake eyelashes with the glue. It kind of like remelts the glue and really gets them to like uh, set up. I've seen people do that on me. It was really nerve wracking. So I was like hot near my eye, but they touch it to their hand. And like, it's like, yeah, I don't know, breast milk when they like heat it up and like test it. It's That's like they're testing one. it and it's like warm and it like really goes up. Ooh, I've never heard that one. Thank you for that. One thing every, every woman should try once. Pilates. <laughs> so hard. Something in your life that you haven't tried that you want to do. I want to jump out of a helicopter on my snowboard. I'm sorry, what? <laughs> I think it's called hella skiing. Yes, it is. But you want to do that? Yeah, but like on my snowboard. Are you a daredevil? Not really, but that sounds really fun and cool. <laughs> my God. <laughs> okay, what are you most looking forward to this next year? I'm most looking forward to seeing where my business goes and grows and seeing mm -hmm. how it kind of changes and evolves because it really does it, and it moves quick and it it's like a child and you're just like the next thing you know, you're, you're like, how did I do this? So I'm looking forward to seeing where it goes. What is one Tate and Taylor product that you would point everybody to as a starting point? I would say my favorite thing that we have on the website right now that is kind of a product that you don't really know you need, but you're glad you have it is we have this paw cleaner from a brand called Dandelion. And it's really interesting because so cool. it's sort of like a hand sanitizer for their paws. And I really love it living in New York, walking my dog around the city. Before we go back into the apartment, we just do this. And so it's, you don't have to rinse it or, or wash it off their paws. You just like yes. literally like a hand sanitizer. And if you want to take a towel and just kind of like, like wipe it down from there, I think it's genius. And it's something that I didn't really think of. And then as I'm using it, I'm like, oh, I didn't even know I needed this. That's a brilliant product. So it's brilliant. And it's what an amazing brand. She's a really cool founder too. Cool. Caroline. Yeah. Okay. A book that you've read, something that you think everybody should read. A book that always stands out to me that I do tell people to read is one called Many Lives, Many Masters. <gasps> it's not a new book. And a, <laughs> it's a really good book. And I think... Do you feel that way about dogs? Yes. And I feel like that about people. And I just feel like if you've gone through grief or loss... Wow. It's a great book because it kind of talks about how you have many lives and many connections. And I do believe that when they're gone, they're not really gone. And it, it, I think it's an amazing book and someone, people should read it. <laughs> I am so with you. Okay, grab that um, deck of cards, please. The question everything deck. Oop. And pick a card, whichever one is called to you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Okay. What's your superpower? Mm. Vulnerability. Yeah. <laughs> I love that one. Okay. Taylor, the smartest decision you've ever made. Moving to New York, getting a dog when I shouldn't have. 
Because <laughs> you were traveling? Yeah, I was 18. Like, I was... Yeah. No. And I shouldn't was- have gotten one, but I did. And it was the best thing I ever did. Mm-hmm. And I moved to New York. But who does that? <laughs> you do. I did. It was great. I love it. Okay, amazing.